German chamomile, we know that its roots will exude sterols. And sterols are a precursor to uh, cannabinoids. And and so... How about marigolds and chili pepper, chili plants? How do those affect uh, um, terpene production? Have you heard you know, or tested I, it about I, around those two specific plants? Uh, but those chitons will stimulate the uh, systemic acquired resistance of a plant uh, or the uh, induced systemic resistance. So you are triggering the, the salicylic acid uh, pathway. The most important thing to remember, and, and, and I think you know, we're getting more and more people to understand this, is, is the importance that plants are not always competing against each other. They're, mm -hmm. In fact, they're sharing the resources. And Have you ever wondered about companion planting with the canna plant to increase quality and flavors? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Av Sai and Mark Bowell on PerfectGardens.com. Please make sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook, and make sure to hit the notifications for future videos like this. If you haven't checked out our $2.99 monthly membership, I highly recommend to do so. We have over 110 members posting quality content on our private Telegram page. Make sure to check us out. Okay, let's go ahead and get into it. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. You mentioned you had... Uh, I think it was stinging nettles planted. And I was curious because I've heard some studies saying that like a lot of companion planting with canna plants, like stinging nettles planted next to a canna plant, it will um, kind of uh, build up a defense mechanism towards the uh, stinging nettles and it might produce more oils for, uh, really? for, for um, you know, trichome production and stuff. Oh, that that's that's interesting. Yeah, that that's uh, um, I'd love to, I'd love to read more about that study. Um, but along along that same thread, now we we're we're very careful. My wife doesn't allow me to uh, leave our stinging nettle un un um, unwatched. So as soon as it hits flower, and typically, you know, in in the biodynamic world, when when stinging nettle hits flower, it's the most powerful. So that's usually the time that I would uh, I would harvest it for a biodynamic practice, but for my teas I harvest it long before flower because I'm I'm scared it will spread everywhere and and we don't want to get into trouble again. What um, about the root zone? The root zone, the roots from the other companion plants next to the canna plants, how they interact with the microbiology, with the the exudates from the other plants well, well, or using yeah, it in your tea or using yeah, it in your exactly. tea well uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't harvest our, our stinging nettle roots but but I, I i i like the way you're thinking aaron and that's that's what actually one of the reasons why we plant uh, german chamomile so german chamomile we know that its roots will exude sterols and sterols are a precursor to uh cannabinoids and and so so we we feel like we can increase our our um, our cannabinoid production because we've got some German chamomile, and then the other benefit of having German chamomile is that it's a small flower, um, and it's going to attract parasitic wasps. Those parasitic wasps, of course, can can um, uh, keep some of your um, uh, predatory species away. So, like uh, how right, how about marigolds and chili pepper, chili plants? How do those affect uh, um, terpene production? Have you heard you know, it or tested I, it about I, around those two specific plants? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I know that um, um, like brassica plants. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those uh, brassica uh, uh, will release brassica steroids. Those um, have been attributed to as biostimulants, and those biostimulants can increase secondary metabolite production. Um, I'm not sure if it, if the pepper roots or that like the, if, if it is exuding uh, capsaicin, if that capsaicin is is in fact a biostimulant. Um, but you know, along the same line, that's that's probably why people are using chitin. Um, you know, whether it's a, a, a chitin that's coming from lobster shells or uh, insect grass or something like that. Uh, but those chitins will stimulate the uh, systemic acquired resistance of a plant. Uh, or the uh, induced systemic resistance. So you are triggering the, the salicylic acid uh, pathway. And when you trigger that, you are getting um, uh, increased secondary metabolite production. So Perfect Garden's vision, five years, 10 years down the road is cannabis farmers solving the world's ag problems. 
And the reason why I'm bringing up these these plants is that I'm always kind of encouraging cannabis growers to put another type of plant in. So just encouraging them, if we put in one or two of these other types of plants, how how far would these exodites be able to travel or how much ratio? Let's say if we have a, um, you know, you know, a 20 by 20 lot of, of in there, normally let's say growers are growing 10 footers um, in, let's say they have 10 of them there. How many uh, plants would you recommend planting every so often? Because that I'm just trying to slowly n- uh, n- urge them or nudge them over into the food direction. So what would you recommend to help them out? You know, just in case type thing. Yeah. I mean, the most important thing to remember, and, and, and I think, you know, we're getting more and more people to understand this is, is the importance that plants are not always competing against each other. They're mm-hmm. in fact, they're sharing the resources and, and a uh, Canadian researcher, Dr. Suzanne Samard, uh, she's, she's getting a lot of, a lot of um, uh, interest in the fact that she's talked about how different species are sharing resources um, and, and so I think it's really important that we use companion planting uh, for, for, for just even that resource sharing part. Um, I also think it's really important to recognize that uh, now that Canada has, has, has legalized and we have large scale grows, Canada world is, is, is blowing up. Um, if we continue to grow in monocultures in, 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 in essentially just a, f- a field of, of cannabis, we are inviting a whole new set of pathogens and a whole s- s- new set of, of pests that we won't be able to control with our, our current ways of controlling them. They're just going to become so rapid. Um, so that's why we need the biodiversity. So we need the biodiversity because of the above ground is going to, to interact and, and challenge some of the pests and pathogens. And of course, we need it below ground because we might get those benefits of some of the exudates from different plants that are going to trigger uh, an immune response in, in the cannabis plant and or it have the exudates that the cannabis plant can use to produce uh, uh, other secondary metabolites. So um, the, the main thing you don't want to do is you don't want to have something that's overly um, competitive and and is is uh, to the point where it's competing against things like for light and for water. Um, so if if you have like white clover growing and white clover is probably not the best because it can attract certain pests, but a low low lying crop it's great to have that cover crop. And then I think of it more of of having um, if you use a permaculture co- concept of guilds, you might have your peppermint. Uh, in a particular place and some lemongrass in a particular place and some chamomile and some dill and some coriander, some parsley, some lovage, um, uh, borage, uh, all of those type of plants growing hither and thither um, to, to attract beneficial insects. And, and that's going to be your best defense against things like uh, hemp borer and uh, cornworm, things like that. Did, did I did I avoid the question about the density? No, no, it's one hundred percent perfect. Yeah. Are you you're I mean I mean want that I want other growers out there to get out of the mind where it's just growing this plant and start to utilize their thought process into exploration and other plants. You know what we were talking about in the very beginning is they they and if they don't take all the wealth that's being accumulated in this opportunity now when they're accumulating small amounts of land and start slowly transitioning, you know they're going to be you know it's like at some point the the like camp market I know it's blowing up and I hope it converts uh, over into fibers into uh, biodiesels into hemp concrete into the sixty five thousand other products that are capable for camp highly recommend 95% of the entire industry. The, the TAC industry is only this minuscule 0.1, 0.3% of the industry. And then it's a little bit CBD, probably a little bit more, but then the majority is over here. So I'm always like, you did it perfect. I'm encouraging these other guys. I want them to just, just think slightly different next year before they plant. You know, as they're creating their, their, their mindset of how to plant, where they should, you know, teal, whatever they should do. I just want to see these, these ideas into their mind before they do that, you know, and, and, you know, maybe a few years down the road, they do, you know, four acres of cannabis, one acre of food, you know, and they get into other markets. And, and, and if you can definitely, um, you know, in, do some interplanting and, and, uh, 
and the benefit of that interplanting is is uh, you know because it's important to know that parasitic wasps and and some of these other beneficial insects they're they're not going to travel an acre necessarily they they will find their food much closer so if you can if you can have them you know interspersed amongst your cannabis plants you you get that opportunity to to um um, have have a, essentially your your mobile host, uh, like a hospital right there for for each plant uh, with all these beneficial insects around them, and you know I don't know how metaphysical uh, you, you you get, but I do find that the can plant is this you know a higher level of intelligence than than a lot of the other plants that I've worked with. I th I think they're they're like an older plant. They're they're a wiser plant. Um, I think they enjoy communicating with other plants. And, and so I think it's, it's a disservice if we end up having, you know, just rows of, of, of cannabis plants in bare soil. Um, so important for them to, to be able to communicate to other plants and, and socialize and um, whatever else plants do that we have no idea that they do. It's so important to recognize that um, the, the soil is, is so incredibly dynamic that within seconds, you can have species that are turning off and species that are turning on. And, when, and once again, thanks to all the work that Elaine Ingham did to highlight this, we now know that there's, there's thousands and thousands of different species 